Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends. This is John O'Leary, and I'm so happy to have you here joining me in the Live Inspired Movement. Today's guest is going to be a treat. His name is John Brinkus, and you may not be familiar with that name, or you may be, but I think you will be extraordinarily familiar with the work that John has done. He is a fairly young guy, and yet he is extraordinarily accomplished. He's driven. He's passionate. He's centered. He's in love with his bride. He's in love with life. He's humble. And I think he's going to unpack some lessons that he's learned in his life as he has journeyed toward launching various shows that have been picked up by Fox, by the Discovery Channel, by ESPN, and many others. The journey toward six Emmys that he has won throughout his production and creativity. The journey that he has had in his interviews with others on his podcast, the way he met his bride, the way he fell in love with her, and 15 years later still is in love with her. He's got a terrific life story. You're going to love it because it's going to remind you, my friends, that so do you. So do you. And the best of your life story remains in front of you. So hang on for it. I want you all to open up your heads, open up your hearts, open up your minds, open up your journals, have those babies in front of you right now. Buckle up because we're bringing the heat today. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast. Our most recent guest, our newest friend, John Brinkus. Thank you so much for having me. This is, you're doing an incredible thing and I really appreciate it. Well, man, I I have been a huge fan of yours and now most recently your podcast for a long time, but I also imagine that some of our listeners may not know yet the name John Brinkus the way I do. So for those of my friends, our followers, our listeners that don't yet know you, tell us a little bit more about who you are today. Tell us about your family and the work that you're doing. Yeah, the uh, thing that I'm best known for is being the host of a property that's on ESPN called Sports Science. In college, Lonzo Ball shot a respectable 41% from the three-point line. But how will his unique jumper hold up at the next level? Find out. We brought him into the ESPN Sports Science Lab and wired him up with a state-of-the-art motion capture suit. It was actually created back in 2006. We sold it. Um, it, it debuted in 2007. has now been on the air for 10 years. Um, we started on Fox Sports. And long story short, we've won six Emmys. And I've written a New York Times bestselling book called The Perfection Point. Um, you know, I've done tons of endorsement deals. Um, and sports science has really brought a lot of opportunities to me. But the journey to sports science... Um, really is it's one of these you know american entrepreneur stories of starting a you know business out of the basement of my parents house so sort of backing up to my childhood i grew up i was born in washington dc grew up in vienna virginia that's 8 miles outside the city um and really lived in vienna very rarely vacationed you know we went to coco beach to visit my grandfather once a year or so um, but I was just a Vienna boy. So it was a small town um, in Vienna. And what was interesting about my street, though, although I lived in a small town, was there is one of everything on my street. Mm. I mean, there is, you know, every race, religion, and demographic you could possibly imagine, all in this one little street. It was called Westview Court. Mm. So while I, I lived in a very small town, I sort of did have a, a, a decent world view that you know, not everybody was the same. Um, and that was important sort of moving forward because as I went to college at the University of Virginia, it wasn't as much of a culture shock um, as it is to some kids because you know, some kids only grow up seeing people who look exactly like them. Yes. And, you know, when they get to college, like, oh, my God, I had no idea some people were different. Um, you know, so I, I felt very blessed um, being brought up um, in Vienna, Virginia, on the street that I was. So I go to UVA, and when I'm at the University of Virginia, I am the kind of person, ever since I was little, I've always been 
when I say um, I'm a skeptical learner, meaning when someone is telling me something, I just don't automatically believe it. Mm -hmm. I really sort of say, does this person know what they're talking about? And my my you know, English teacher in uh, the, my sophomore year in high school was the one who really drilled this into me, who said, no matter what you hear, consider the source. <laughs> and I, so I, when I went to the University of Virginia, I'm sitting there, and it's a fantastic school. Um, and I'm, you know, considering the source and really learning a lot and getting, getting a lot out of it. But I knew it wasn't pushing me in the direction that I wanted to go because I very early on knew I wanted to go into entertainment. And I told my parents, I said, look, I want to be, in, I want to make TV shows, I want to make movies, I want to do something in entertainment, and I'm not sure college is the best thing for me, and I think I want to drop out. Mm. And my mother, who was actually in academia at George Mason, she um, was running the College of Nursing and Health Science, she said, well, what's your backup plan? Like, what, what are you going to do if you leave? And I said, you know what, I'm not exactly sure, but I just, I don't know if I'm getting what I want out of this. So she said, well, go have a conversation with your dean and talk this out before you make a decision. So I went to my dean, and I said, I am not sure I'm getting what I want. He said, you know what, the University of Virginia, if you actually look in the, the course description, um, in the course books, there's a thing called independent studies where you can just make up all of your own classes. So I said, really? He's like, yeah, what do you want to do? I said, I want to make films and TV shows. He said, why don't you make your own screenwriting class and make your own editing class and make your own directing class and do everything you want to do, find professors to sponsor you. So I literally developed my own major. And in that process, um, there was a, a gentleman named Bob Ghazali who was running the Virginia Independent Film Festival. And I went to him and I said, hey, I want to get into this movie TV show thing. What do you suggest I do? He said, well, there's this young kid that lives in the area. His name is Steven Soderberg. Hmm. And he just finished up this movie, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And yes. he's finishing up a movie called Kafka. Track him down. So I ended up tracking down Steven Soderberg and doing an independent study with him. And I got credit for this. And we, you know, we sort of, he was my mentor in college. And the advice that he gave me was, if you want to be in this business, whatever it is you want to do in life, just learn to do it yourself. Only rely on yourself. Teach yourself everything you possibly can and make sure that you can make a TV show or a movie tip to tail all on your own. That way, as you continue your journey, you'll figure out what you really love and what you're really good at. You might, you might be great at one thing and not so good in another, but at least you'll be able to figure out who do I need to really hire and what is it that I can do myself? That really shaped me moving forward because shortly after I graduated college, I graduated um, a semester early. I teamed up with my uh, then future brother-in-law. He's now my brother-in-law. And we started a business out of the basement of my parents' house. And we made a movie up in New York. And after the movie, we got uh, some investment dollars um, where we bought this non-linear digital editing system called the Avid. And when we had, so we had like the highest tech piece of technology in Washington, D.C., in the basement of my parents' house on Westview Court. And we ended up landing contracts with the uh, Washington, uh, then Bullets, now Wizards, yes. the Washington Capitals. You know, the, we were doing work with the St. Louis Rams. Man, how, how old are you at this point? So I'm now 46. But back and, then, and when at you're that in... point, I was 23 or 24. Um, so it was a while ago. It was a long time ago. Um, but we ended up having that contract for 17 years, and that really developed our sport background because we had all these contracts with all these sport teams where we were, we were doing their you know, coaches' shows and um, all of their commercials and PSAs and tons of just sports-related uh, content. At the same time, in the D.C. area, was um, this channel called the Discovery Channel. And it was emerging, and they were branching off to create uh, a channel called the Science Channel. And because not many people from Northern Virginia make movies, we had gotten some press about the movie that we had made in New York, and we were sort of the, you know, the, young, the young kids you know, blazing a Hollywood yeah. trail. And that was sort of the, the story that was being written about us. So the Discovery Channel came to us and said, hey, you guys are doing this 
lot, you know, the science, I mean, the sports programming, we want you to do a lot of science programming and, you know, make it really cool. So we did a, the first interactive live science program that was called Science Live. Um, we did a show called XMA, Extreme Martial Arts, um, that was looking at the science of martial arts where Tom Cruise was doing the raps for it hmm. um, for, the, uh, for The Last Samurai. And that show, XMA, was a really big turning point in our professional career because it was very high profile, did very well for us on, this, on the Discovery Channel, and National Geographic then came to us and said, hey, we really like that XMA show. Why don't you make the same kind of show but science it up? Make it even more science-y. So we made a show called Fight Science, and we brought in all the world's greatest martial artists to punch and kick the crap out of a crash test <laughs> dummy to see which style generated the most amount of force. That show was like top 10 of all time for National Geographic at the time. And Fox owned National Geographic and Fox Sports. And they decided to run Fight Science opposite the original Peyton Manning versus Eli Manning Sunday night football game. And the, uh, that show, Fight Science, was like the third highest rated program of the year with no promotion at all. And Fox Sports was like, oh, my God, people love this science stuff. What else do you have? And so I got the show called Sports Science. We're going to take that fight science approach where we bring athletes into a lab. But it's going to not just be martial arts. It'll be athletes from every sport. We're going to build the biggest, you know, the, the best performance lab in the world, invite the world's greatest athletes, and put them to the test. And they said, oh, my God, that's an amazing idea. But how are you going to get the athletes to show up? I said, look, if you're great at something, you don't do it for money. And I think these guys who have $100 million contracts, I think that if you put them up to a challenge and say, we're going to scientifically test you and you're going to learn something and you can confirm how good you think you are or what you need to work on, I think that's, and that's an opportunity that athletes would jump at. It, 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 literally, people are like, you're crazy. You're not going to get these guys to roll out of bed for, you know, unless you pay them tons of money. I said, I don't think so. So... When we first started in our first two seasons on Fox, we got people like Ray Lewis, Ben Roethlisberger, Drew Brees, Larry Fitzgerald, Jerry Rice, giant names. And once you start getting yes. one name and two Dominoes names. Dominoes start falling. Yeah, everything. The floodgates open. Um, so we were on Fox Sports for two years. We won three Emmys there. Um, very, you know, very grateful for it. And ESPN came along. Um, acquired uh, sports science, and we've been on ESPN now. I think we're in our eighth season there. Uh, won another three Emmys, and you know, sports science really opened up those doors. Um, where you know, my my job for um, ESPN is to work with the world's greatest athletes and to put them to the test. And you know, it's sort of that dream job. Yeah. And a lot of people really always say, "Well, how in the world do you, do you do that? You know, how do I get that job?" and Literally, I'm like, well, I just made the job. John, I'm That's curious, as, as you are considering dropping out and then starting your little studio and the, the new technology in the basement and then XMA and fight science, <laughs> it, it, is there a plan? Is there an ultimate goal? Or are you just continually taking the next best step forward? Honestly, I always think, okay, the next thing I do has got to be bigger and better, whatever, whatever that is. And I really believe very strongly in the energy of the universe pushing you in a particular direction. When, when you sit back and you say, okay, what could have happened out of that basement in Virginia? Um, we'd done everything from financing a band um, that was named Emmett Swimming out of uh, <laughs> Northern Virginia. We financed a band. I mean, when you say finance, you, know, you gave a you know, few thousand dollars yes. to help them record an album. But that band ended up getting signed to yes. Epic Records. So we could have gone down the path of, you know, trying to be music moguls and saying, okay, we're going to start a label and we're going to sign bands and get the major label deals or whatever. Could have gone down that road, but we didn't. We, had a, uh, we did a CD-ROM project, and if anybody remembers, like mm -hmm. back in the 90s, there was a game called Myst that was like this big, you know, huge hit. It was a CD-ROM game, and we ended up making a CD-ROM game um, for a, a um, nationally syndicated a morning radio show, and it just did gangbusters. Made a bunch of money off of it. it was really successful, and we could have gone down the road of being gamers, um, but we didn't. We were we we 
didn't go that direction. Um, we ended up going the direction, just, the, you know, God, the universe, however you relate to it, pushed us in a direction of fusing sport and science. It almost seemed inevitable that that would happen. Um, and the way that it happened, it just, it's one of those things where it just felt right. You know, the business was coming in. It was, you know, it continually built upon itself. Um, and so you just sort of go that way. That's the, that was the direction that, that uh, we ended up choosing. L- looking back on those Emmys and the fight science and XMA and the, the games and signing the band, w- what has surprised you now that you are where you are looking back on the journey to this point? <clears throat> what has surprised me is that that journey that everybody takes, the time frame is so different for everybody. There are some people who work their whole lives and they never sort of get to the place where they ultimately want to be. And obviously it's really about the destination. It's really about the journey, not the destination. But in our case, it took us, you know, our company, and we ended up selling our company, um, our production company, and that was sort of the the goal once when we originally started it was, well, I want to, you know, ultimately you want to build something and be able to sell it. You know, our company... You know, it took us a decade, you know, seven, ten years to really get our footing underneath us. And if you think about the persistence, the stubbornness, the belief that you have to have to stick around something where, you know, you're just scraping by. Yes. um, You know, we were scraping by for a, it it was a long time. Was there a point, John, where you thought, you know what, I may just uh, ask my dad if they're hiring at his office. (laughs) You know, sell I, I the guess, equipment out of the basement, fire my brother-in-law, and move on with life. <laughs> That's a, it's an awesome question. You know, the answer is no. I, I, and I can honestly say there was never a moment where I sent a resume to a company and said, hey, I want to go work for them or, you know, thought about doing anything different. I was just singularly focused on somehow being in the world of entertainment and figuring it out. You know, I had no family connections to it. Didn't really know anybody in the industry at all. Um, you know, it, it was it was just it's just this stubbornness and sort of the way that I'm wired. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my wife loves to call me Johnny One Speed. <laughs> you know, I'm either on or I'm off. And you know, in the case uh, in my professional life, I'm just always I'm just always on. You know, I'm just just go 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 and keep plowing. And you know, if a wall gets thrown up in front of you, you're you, you, you don't really look at it as a wall. You say, oh, I either have to walk around it, climb up it, burrow my way through it, or go under it. Man, like I've just got to figure it out. When you look at all the things that you've been part of that are now on your resume, and we're, we're not even to the final chapter yet, but yep. looking back at this point, is there one aspect that motivates you to continue to, to do the good work more than something else? So is it sports? Is it science? Is it entertainment? Is it a paycheck? What really motivates me, which always has, um, and especially now, <clears throat> is spreading positive energy. Mm. And if you look at my body of work, um, you know, in television, um, especially, it's like I'm just we just want to we just want to spread positive energy and not only entertain but educate as well. Um, you know, the uh, now that we've sold our company, but I'm still the host of Sports Science. Um, you know, I'm hosting Sports Science, and it's an incredibly positive property. It is, and, and a lot of people say, you know, wow, that's a, you know, that's an amazing show. How did you come up with it? The answer really is, it's a reflection. It's a reflection of me and my partner mm-hmm. that we just want to put out positive energy, entertain and educate people. Um, in a way that people hadn't seen before. Um, sort of the next chapter um, uh, that I'm now entering is starting a new podcast. Yeah, I'm and, a, and I'm, that, a, I'm a fan already. We're going to talk about that podcast next. But before we turn the page, I, I want to ask you, looking back at the fight science aspect, is there one episode, one learning that looking back on it, you're like, oh, my gosh, yes, th- this episode rocked. I can't believe this is true. I will, t- I will tell you the, this, is, this is the honest story. So fight science was, the, was sort of the precursor to sports science. Um, and the fact that that show resonated 
was crazy. And when, when we're getting into the fight world and saying, well, we're going to do the science of fighting, the honest truth was I didn't know anything about the fight world. I mean, I, I'm a science geek. I'm a sports geek, but I really didn't know anything about, you know, mixed martial arts or taekwondo or whatever. I just I didn't know anything. So when we were starting the show, I flew out um, to Las Vegas to meet with the only name I recognized in mixed martial arts. His name is Randy Couture, <laughs> and he was like the face of the UFC um, you know, back mm-hmm. when we were making fight science. And I literally called, got his number through some contact, called him, said, hey, can I meet with you to talk about a show that we're doing? Sat down, and here he is. You know, he, Randy Couture is Captain America. Um, he's become a very good friend. But he, when, I, when we sat down and I said, look, you're the face of this giant growing sport, I want you to come on the show called Fight Science and be the ambassador um, for explaining... Yes. The game, because I, I, I can't do it. And he agreed to do it for free, flew out, did, just did an amazing job. And I'm like, wow, if you ask people yes. to do, to help you, it's amazing what people are willing to do. There is a singular moment in sports science. So after fight science, we created sports science. There is a singular moment that I can tell you that happened. And it was actually in season two. We made season one, and it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. It was, you know, we were shooting in an unconditioned air, air uh, plane hangar down in Hawthorne Airport that was on, like, literally right next to um, the airport. So mm-hmm. it was loud. The runway was there. Planes are going by. It's, you know, it, no joke, is way over 100 degrees inside this hangar. I'm getting these giant athletes for free. I mean, it was so taxing. We had to shoot everything in like three weeks for the season. So it was really hard. Then season two comes along, and we're like, oh, my God, are we going to be able to do this again? And we sit down, take three deep breaths, and create a whole season worth of shows. There was one moment with Kevin Love. So Kevin Love came into the lab, and we wanted to set the world record for the longest basketball shot. And... um we, we, we set it up so that it was a foot longer than before. And Kevin, you know, he's shooting at 80-plus feet. He's, he's, and it's really hard to get a basketball to go that far. So he's shooting and shooting and shooting, and the ball will not go in. It just won't go in. Hit the rim, hit the backboard, miss it all together. And we're sitting there with a giant crew, <laughs> and we break for lunch. And I'm like, Kevin, this has been great. You know, you're free to keep practicing if you want, but we got to move on. So we eat lunch. Kevin Love is just shooting and shooting and shooting. We break for lunch, come back, and I say to him, like, look, we, we got to wrap up. I really appreciate your time. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This one's just, you know, it just, just wasn't meant to me. He said, give me one, one shot, one more shot. And it wasn't like a, you know, made for TV yes. one more shot where one shot meant 10. I said, all right, I'm paying these people a lot of money. It's costing me a lot of money. You get one shot. He takes that one shot and makes it, and we're going crazy, and I gathered the crew around, and I said, this is all that I can tell you. God wants sports science to exist, (laughs) because the odds of that ball going in on that one last try, and I'm like, it was like divine intervention that it actually happened. There have been so many moments where we say one more try, one more try, one more try. And it's almost a prayer to me so where I, I'm saying, look, I need some divine intervention in order for this you know, segment to work out. I haven't seen that episode. I'm curious, though, after he made it, I'm assuming the reaction he provides is legit. Oh, yeah. I mean, you does can, he go look crazy? Up Kevin loves sports science. He's been on the show several times. Look up the, um, the first one where it's uh, longest basketball shot. It, when you watch it, I mean, it is, it's unbelievable. And it's, what's funny is how, um, you know, I, I, when I moved over to ESPN, one of the first people I met was Trent Dilfer. And Trent's become a very good friend of mine. But, but Trent walked up to me and said, dude, that Kevin Love segment had to be fake. It's, like, there's, there's no, it, it's too convenient to say one last time and then you make it. It's like, it's like, made for, you know, it's like a Hollywood thing. I said, I said you call Kevin, call, his aide, call anybody. Everything that you see is legit, legit. And he's, he's like, oh, my God. 
And that's what makes it so great is that the show is so authentic. From that show, you eventually leap to what you're doing today, which I believe is called the Brink of Midnight Podcast. Yes. Tell our listeners a little bit more about the podcast that you've launched. So the Brink of Midnight Podcast focuses on the moments in someone's life where everything changed. An event happened, and from that point forward, nothing would ever be the same. I have a very specific Brink of Midnight moment, um, which is the way that I met my wife. So I was making a show and scouting in uh, Aspen, Colorado, and I had to fly back to Los Angeles, passing through Denver. I was traveling with a business colleague, and when we got on the plane in Denver, there was a ticket mix-up, and the person I was traveling with and I got separated. So I'm not even sure if I sat down in the correct seat. I just sat down in one of the two seats we were assigned, and I sat, na- sat, I sat next to the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. I'm unbathed, unshowered. I'm a total wreck. It's Sunday morning. I'm like, oh, my God. And I run to the bathroom. I put water in my hair. I'm like, oh, my God, I hope I look all right. And, you know, I lean over, introduce myself. I say, John Brankus. In the second that we meet, I, when I say love at first sight, it was like love at first proximity. Just like just being what, was in that the, a one way street man or was it mutual? Oh, it was completely mutual. So what happened was we had a mechanical problem on the plane, and the we all had to get off the plane. I go up to the guy that we're traveling that I'm traveling with, and I say, "I'll give you a hundred dollars to stay away from me." <laughs> just met the girl I'm going to marry. So I was 31 at the time, and my wife and it, Lizzie ended up calling her parents saying, hey, I just met the guy I'm going to marry. We spent five hours in the Denver airport. Just, I mean, time just went by in the blink of an eye. We get back on the plane. I say to her, so what are the chances that I could get your information? She said, pretty good. She writes down her information. Turns out we live two blocks away from each other on the same street in Brentwood. <laughs> And we met in Denver. And, and at the time, she was holding a book that she had bought that was called A Perfect Match. Mm. So we don't really have an engagement date. We have the second we met, I'm like, oh, sometimes God throws you a softball, and this is, this is my soulmate. This is the person I'm supposed to marry. We ended up, um, you know, we ended up meeting in March. We got married in December. Um, we got married in December in the Vatican, um, in St. John Lateran in Rome. Mm. And, uh, you know, we've been married for 14 years, have two amazing kids and, you know, have lived happily ever after. And it's, but it's those moments that, you know, that one singular moment, everything for me, professionally, spiritually, personally changed on that moment. And when I talked about, you know, it took us, you know, a decade to really build our business. The point that I met Lizzie, that was the inflection point. We actually were making XMA at that time, and our business took off. You know, my personal life took off. You know, my spiritual life really took off. Like, everything took off from that one singular moment. Dude, it's an amazing story. I've never heard it before. I'm, I'm curious. We all who travel a lot occasionally sit next to pretty girls, and pretty girls sit next to pretty guys, and there's a, there's a lot of fine people traveling around. What was it about Lizzie and that proximity that made it a perfect match? So we were, I've always asked that, uh, I think, uh, you know, even rephrasing that question is, you know, how did that moment happen? And I can only tell you that it's divine. The, you know, what was it about her is, I, I mean, she is, I believe that she's the most beautiful person on the planet. But obviously, you know, you can't just go by what's on the surface. I believe that we all emanate energy. And, you know, if you are if you're sort of take a chemistry analogy, our outer ring is unstable. And you're looking for those intangible things that fill your outer ring to make you complete. And Lizzie just filled me, just completed me. You know, it's, it's the, you know, you complete me sort of, uh, Terry McGuire saying it just immediately happened. Um, and for her, it was the same thing. And it's sort of what, whatever it is that she was missing, I had, and whatever it is that I was missing, you know, she had, um, it really was just this intangible, undeniable 
event. Dude, what I love, John, in hearing you share that story is not only how it happened and how you felt about her, but when you share that story, um, I mean, dude, you, you have laid out for us how you built all these businesses. You've interviewed some phenomenal people. You've had a whole lot of great successes, and yet your voice heightened when you started talking about your fiance, you started talking about Lizzie, the, the energy you felt for her 15 years ago, you feel still for her today. And I think that is so attractive. It's so inspiring. It's, it is a divine mystery of how love, whether or not it's a love for your child or, you know, love for your spouse or whatever. It's amazing how it can continually grow. You say to yourself every day, Oh my God, there's no way I could love this person anymore. And somehow the next day, it grows even yeah. more. It's like love genuinely is infinite, and it just continually grows, and it just blows me away. And sort of the you know, much younger person I was when I met Lizzie, um, you know, I still have that, you know, those young eyes and that, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. I mean, every time I see her, you, know, you get those butterflies in your stomach. You're like, oh, my God, I cannot believe this is my soulmate, this is mm-hmm. my wife. Um, you know, and I, I think that that appreciation of um, the great fortune that I've been able to have, obviously, um, just meeting Lizzie, I mean, that's, I mean, what else, what else do you want other than finding love? And I think that, you know, we all are just, I think our, our job here on the planet is just to perpetuate love in whatever manner that is. And whatever it is that brings you love or gives you loves or creates love is... Um, it's infinite. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. And that's what really, with the, with the podcast, what we're doing is diving deep with all of our guests and finding out what, were, what was the moment, what was the brink of midnight moment that you had that changed you forever. Sometimes it's a very, very dark event. It's a, it's a tragedy. And sometimes it's you know, divine intervention in something um, you know, falling out of the sky mm-hmm. uh, that brings you great fortune. It's everybody's story is different, but I can tell you, as you know, I mean, your story uh, on its own is just just blows me away, and I can't wait to have you on uh, on the podcast as a guest. But as you know, everybody has mm. that moment in their life where everything changes from that point forward. John, as you have interviewed several dozen guests already, and, and it's really getting incredible traction out there in the marketplace. Is there one story in particular that just leaps off at you as blowing you away as you were sitting back with the headset on listening to someone else share their, their, their brink of midnight experience? You know, the, every single story just simply blows me away. I can just, I can just highlight a few of them. Um, you know, Ray Lewis, for example, um, you know, what's interesting is interviewing all these high profile guests Winning a Super Bowl or making the great catch or, you know, winning an Oscar or whatever it is, that's not the brink of midnight moment in someone's life. They're like, oh, that's just the culmination of, you know, the hard work that I put in and that just kind of happened. That wasn't the thing that changed me. You talk to Ray Lewis, I'm like, what's the one event that changed your life? When he was 14 years old, he was living with his mother. He had a, a single mom. His dad was nowhere to be found. His mom was in a very abusive relationship uh, with her boyfriend, and Ray looked at this and said, I need to change this situation. So he asked his mother for a deck of cards. Mm. And she said, what do you need the deck of cards for? He said, just give me a deck of cards. He went into his room, and he would throw down a 10, er, and he would do 10 push-ups. He'd throw down a jack, and he'd do 10 sit-ups. He'd throw down a 3 and do 3 push-ups. He would do thousands of push-ups and sit-ups over the you know, course six months to a year, and just with the sole goal to become big enough and strong enough to threaten this guy to get out of his house. Mm. And he said, when that, that is the moment that defined me, where he's a very spiritual man, he said, but God has given me the ability to take control of my own life and to change the things that I don't want to be in my life. And he's 14 years old at the time. John, and, n- n- before you even talk any more about Ray... Some of our listeners may not know the name Ray Lewis, so uh, explain to them uh, what this man is like today, just so it'll give them a little bit more perspective on how he changed from this little 14-year-old kid. So Ray Lewis is a a two-time Super Bowl winning linebacker, considered to be the best linebacker ever in the history of the NFL. 
Um, he's only one of a couple players, uh, defensive players, to be the MVP of a Super Bowl. Um, he's best known for you know, rallying his team, um, for being the center of positive energy. And you know, the statue of him that's outside yes. of the stadium where the, where the Ravens play um, is him in his you know, stance where he's pumping everybody up <laughs> as he comes out of the tunnel. Um, you know, he, he's just this amazing uh, player, but he was on the field. He was ferocious. I mean, it's just like sort of that Jekyll and Hyde personality of the nicest guy off the field, but super ferocious on the field. Um, and, you know, that story of when he was 14 of taking life and, you know, his destiny into his own hands is one that, that you know, really, really resonated with me. Um, you know, there's another great story about Rob Riggle. So if your audience doesn't know who Rob Riggle is, he's, you know, famous actor and comedian and has been in a ton of movies, you know, like The Hangover and, um, if you just look up Rob Riggle, you know, everybody has seen him because he's done a ton of commercials, ton of movies, um, and, he, and also was on Saturday Night Live. He was, in, um, he was in the Marines, flying for the Marines. And out of nowhere, his friend called him, who was living in Chicago, and, and um, Rob was stationed down south in Missouri. He got a call. And his friend said, you know how you were a goofball in college? He's like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, you know what? There's this thing going on up here in Chicago. It has a name. It's called improv. You should totally do this. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I've never even considered the comedy world at all. Um, and I'm in the military, and I have, I'm a pilot. And it, it's an eight-year initial commitment, then nine years after that. And he's like, I don't want to abandon my country. And I'm already, he was already three years into his service. He went down to the beach, and he wrote down on a piece of paper, I will be on Saturday Night Live, on a piece of paper. And he went back to, um, he went back, told all of his superiors that he wanted to change to being in the ground troops. That was only a five-year commitment. So he said, I'll serve out my two years. Um, And then he wants to go off and do his own thing. Long story short, 10 years, almost to the day, from him writing down, I will be on Saturday Night Live, he ended up being cast on Saturday Night Live. He's like, that's divine intervention. <laughs> that's a brink of midnight moment. When you look back at these phenomenal interviews and these remarkable stories and the guys and gals that endured, survived, and then thrived afterwards, is there a common thread that pulls them all together? Is there a trait or a characteristic or a belief system? One thing that you think they all kind of share I think there is. I think that it's, it's really two things. One is they'll recognize that something is happening, you know, for better or worse. Then they have to act upon it. And that's sort of the, when I sat next down to Lizzie, I mean, if you were to say how many guys are just immediately going to launch into a conversation and, you know, just make this happen, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm so nervous and, you know, I don't know, and she probably thinks I'm a jerk or whatever. Like, you just have to recognize something is happening and then take action. Mm. And which separates, I think, us when I, when I say, why doesn't everybody have these amazing stories where it brings them good fortune or turns their, turns their life around? I mean, obviously, there are so many people who have a brink of midnight moment, but it didn't quite work out. And the reason why I say, you know what, these incredibly divine moments, sometimes uh, when people look back and they say, look, you know, I've had horrible things that have happened in my life and I'm down and, you know, I'm out and I don't know how to get, get back. It's the opportunities are there, but you have to seize it somehow. And you have to be willing to sacrifice. You have to be willing to have that those very hard conversations with yourself of what am I willing to do in order to change the situation that I'm in? John Brankus, not all of us will interview Ray Lewis or build uh, businesses that interest ESPN in purchasing them. So l- l- let's make it real for a moment before we shift gears. If your spouse and the relationship you have with Lizzie and the way you remain in love with her almost 15 years later, th- that's real, man. And that's, by the way, not chance. It's choice. So for those of us in relationships with colleagues at work, with ladies and gentlemen at home, with little ones, uh, wherever they may be living, 
how can we be more intentional in the way we go about our work in, in that in that part of our lives? I think, and I, I mean this seriously, I think that um, prayer, in whatever form it is, there you know, I firmly, firmly believe I'm a spiritual man. But I firmly believe that there is not one right religion, but there's an undeniable energy to the universe. And everybody relates to it through a different lens. I think the key to doing better at work, having better personal relationships, um, just being a better person is stopping to reflect. And whether it's meditation or prayer or whatever it is, it's stopping, really assessing what did I do well? What did I not do well? Being very honest and praying and meditating on being better and having the courage to be better. You know, the pastor at my church said something that I, I think is one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. It's that prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes you. When, we're, when, we're, when we are trying to connect with the universe— That idea of succumbing to a higher power and saying, you know what, there is a standard that is much higher and much better than what I am now. And my job throughout life is to keep reaching and stretching and growing to try to reach an ideal that I know I'll never reach. I mean, we all know that, but that shouldn't prevent us from trying. If we know, well, you know what, we're never going to finish this race and be perfect, you can say, well, then why even start? Or you can say... But how close can I get? How, how close to that ideal person that I know that I can be can I get? And that's a lifelong journey. Mm. Well, man, I, I'm grateful you're sharing the journey with us. And we, we are going to shift gears now into an area that we call the Live Inspired Seven. Seven questions that all of our guests are asked and then answer on the show. And, John, the first question is, what's the best book that you've ever read? God, the best book that I have ever read, there's so many. Um, I will say that my favorite book, it's funny because I'll have two answers for you. One is on the fiction side, it's The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. A big Fitzgerald fan. Um, I'm not a huge fiction aficionado, but that book really resonates me with this man who has everything except the one thing he wants. (laughs) It's like... It's like this perfect story. I sometimes, though, wonder if we read way more into that than Fitzgerald had planned with the green light on the dock. And I remember back in high school, the teacher kind of blew the story up in such a dramatic way. And I wonder, gosh, it's phenomenal. But did Fitzgerald even mean all that? Was that the the meaning behind his writing? I, I, I think that's a great argument. You know, the question is, I mean, Fitzgerald never wrote his own cliff notes saying this is what yes. I meant. Right? He just sort of wrote it and then let it be. But that's what makes a piece of art so great, is that you can read into it what you want to read into it. Um, and for me, you know, all of the symbolism um, scattered throughout that, that book in yes. particular really resonated with me at an early age of you know, this, this man yearning for everything and he can get everything except the one yes. thing that he wants. You know, whether or not it was Daisy or yes. whether or not it's the whatever it is that you want in your own life, you know, it's um it, it it's a great story. No doubt. Um you know, I think on the on the non on the nonfiction side, um, you know, there there are so many I mean, when I'd say there are so many science books that I read and, you know, quantum physics books and you know, things that I just dive into on the science side. Um you know, one of my one of my favorite um, nonfiction stories um, is "Under the Banner of Heaven," hmm. um, and I don't know if you've read that by Krakauer. I, yes, man, it's it, a phenomenal book. Oh, it's just it's one of those books. You know, that and the book "Born to Run" are two amazing books that I keep going back to. And "Under the Banner of Heaven" is this amazing story um, that focuses on uh, the Mormon religion and how it came to be and. Um, what I think Krakauer does really well is acknowledge that religion in general um, has the luxury of time to hide behind. <clears throat> so sort of, you know, the tenets of, you know, Buddhism or Christianity or whatever, thousands of years old, 
but Mormonism is a new, you know, relatively new religion. So it doesn't have the luxury of time to hide behind. Um, and it's interesting to see how, um, how it evolved um, into what it is today. And, you know, a lot of my best friends are Mormon, I, and for whatever reason, um, I, gr- I grew up with a lot of my friends being Mormon. And I, I you know, I love all religions, all faiths. Um, and I think that that book, Under the Banner of Heaven, really gives you a good look at how religions sort of evolve. If your house caught fire and all living things, that's your wife and your babies, all living uh, animals are out, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one thing that really matters to you, John, what would you run in and get? Uh, My prayer book that my mother gave me when I was seven years old. Tell me about the prayer book. The prayer book is for my first Holy Communion. Uh, My mother gave me this, you know, little tiny black prayer book that I still have to this day, that I travel with everywhere I go. You know, it's on my bedstand no matter what hotel I'm in or if I'm, or if I'm at home. Um, it's just this one, it's this one object that I don't go anywhere without it, and it means, and it's not even the words inside the book, it's the moment in time of, you know, it was my mother giving me a gift for a you know, significant event, and it's just been that object that that would be the that's the only object actually that I can even think of that that I just make sure all right I want this and it's interesting how it's not a material good right like uh, you wouldn't run them. in and get something that's expensive you get something that emotionally and spiritually really connects with you right on man I, I appreciate that that's why we asked the question it's not the uh, the fur coat it's no. the uh, the two dollar prayer book so thank you for that. <laughs> If you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would you want to sit with? Um, you know, for me, can I have two people? You may. One on, one on each side? <laughs> yes. I would love to have Thomas Jefferson on one side and Pope John Paul II on the other. I would love to dig into Jefferson. I went to the University of Virginia, a big Jefferson fan, um, and really dig into, you know, what was what, what are your personal moments, and how in the world were you? Did you guys have the vision that the country would be ultimately what it what mm-hmm. it has become? And with Pope John Paul II, was such an influential figure for me. Um, you know, I would really want to dig in and say, you know, this was the first pope, um, you know, to visit. Uh, you know, a synagogue that was right down the street from the Vatican. You know, he, he traveled to more countries than, than any uh, prior pope, spoke more languages, and really spread that message of love everybody. Um, you know, as you know, he was a stand-up comic in Poland and, you know, took a very unusual path um, to becoming pope. But I think that he was such an influence in the love everybody idea, um, you know, and really reinforcing that, look, no matter... You know, if somebody disagrees with you, if they have different views, just that that means you have to step up that much yes. more and love everybody. Thank you. What's the best advice that you've ever received? Um, you know what? It's the, the best advice that I have received. Um, it, it, I'm going to have a couple answers. It's the, you know, Steven Soderbergh telling me, do everything yourself. Like that was, and I was, you know, 18, 19 years old at the time. That really sunk in for me. That was like the whole reason I went to college was to learn something. And learning, you know what? You need to teach yourself everything. You got you to figure it out somehow. You know, track down all the resources, do it yourself, um, and that way you can learn the whole process. Um, that was, you know, an amazing piece of advice. Um, the, you know, also the... The piece of advice that my wife, my wife is just, you know, an amazing, um, you know, influence on me. Um, you know, she's, you know, the co- she's basically the creator of the Brink of Midnight podcast, and we have a band called the Brink of Midnight, and she's the singer. She's amazing. Um, you know, but she is the person that always, you know, calms me down and says, take three deep breaths, look at the positive side. Like, just really assess Although you're upset at this moment, look at all the things that you have to be grateful for, and that thing that's making you 
upset is going to dwindle. Mm. Um, so she, you know, that, that among the millions, millions of pieces of advice that she's given me, um, that's the one that really stands out. What would you tell your 20 year old self? That, God, that is such a great question. Um, when I was 20, I think I was, I think I was pretty brash and, you know, bold and, um, you know, that idea about, you know, learn everything yourself, do everything yourself. Mm-hmm. The thing that I was unprepared for is I would say really respect people who really know what they're doing. Like, be willing to give up control of something because you know you're putting it in good hands. And I had a, a very difficult time doing that uh, when I was 20, to be honest with you. Um, so the, as I've grown older, I've become so much better at delegating Mm -hmm. saying, you know what, I'm not good at this. You know, I trust you to do an amazing job at that. That's one thing that I would tell my 20 year old self. You know, so I know your heart. I've heard you long enough on air, both on television and also now through the podcast to know you. Uh, and so I knew you weren't being brash, but I'm glad you clarified that because we can't do it all by ourselves. It's important we know how to hold the camera and edit, but uh, we need professional folks who hold the camera and professional editors and professional leaders that can step alongside of us and guide us forward. So, uh, dude, great clarification. And my final question to you, Brother John, is it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you want your one sentence to read? I believe my one sentence would be, he was authentic, period. Good is a word that you use when something is not great, and he strived to be great. <laughs> that, would, that, would be my, that would be the one sentence that would, uh, that would sum it up. And actually, that, that phrase, good is a word you use when something is not great, is something that I said when I was five years old in kindergarten, and I'll never forget it. I had colored in a, you know, color, it was a, you know, coloring assignment, and I handed it to the teacher, and the teacher looked at it and said, "Yeah, this is good." And I said to her, <laughs> "Good is a word you use when something is not great. That is great." And it was it was something that stuck with me that I'm like, that is a really funny thing for a five year old to say. But it is what goes on in my mind. So if <laughs> right. you're gonna do something, don't just don't don't settle for the good. Try, at least try to be great. Um, and if you want to be successful in anything, it's got to be authentic. And I like to use the phrase: it has to be something. Um, so you know, I use the example of Nirvana a lot. Of you know, imagine if somebody you know had told Kurt Cobain, you know, try to sing with a le- less screechy voice. You know, smooth it out. That's what people like. They were just being authentic, Mm -hmm. and by doing something that was different and was authentic, it turned out that it was great, and it changed the world. Well, Johnny One Speed, you are absolutely (laughs) authentic, and your work is outstanding. Your love, uh, Miss Lizzie, must be a delight. So it has been such a pleasure to spend this time with you. I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, I think that what you're doing with your podcast and what you've done with your life is just, it's, it's really remarkable. And, you know, I'm really, really happy for your success. And I think that when we started our part podcast, the brink of midnight, you know, we believe that there is an audience for positive stories and positive energy. And you obviously were way ahead of the curve on that because, you know, their positive energy begets positive energy. Well, you're exactly right. And uh, my friends, that was John Brankus. This is John O'Leary. And today is your day. Live inspired. Well, hello, my friends. Anytime I start getting a little bit of an ego that I have accomplished a lot in my life, I will tune back into this podcast and be reminded immediately of how little in some regards I have achieved. John has done a lot. John Brinkus, that is. He has accomplished great things. And yet in listening to his heart and his passion for work, for growth, for creativity, for others, what caught me the most, and I think you heard it too, is his desire to be a great spouse. 
that he still gets gets butterflies every time his wife of a decade and a half, Lizzie, walks into the room. I think that is so cool. It's something that each one of us should strive for regardless of where we are today relationally. We ought to be so in love with others, our partners, our spouse, our work, the sunrise, the warm coffee in front of us. That it gives us butterflies every time we think how lucky we are to have this person, this experience, this opportunity, this life. Uh, I, I'm so grateful that you tuned in to the John Brinkus episode. If you enjoyed this, you're going to enjoy all the episodes that we have lined up for you at JohnO'LearyInspires.com. That, that's where we keep them all. It's our library. It's our archive. It's where we also have our show notes It's where you can learn more about my work as a presenter or as an author. But check it out today. You're going to love it. JohnO'LearyInspires.com. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, do me a big favor. Post about it online. Tell your friends in the back of wherever you worship, wherever you work, wherever you buy your groceries, wherever you pick up your coffees, that you are tuning in to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Let's expand this ripple effect. Let's touch more lives. Let's together wake people up from accidental living so that together and individually, we can choose to live inspired lives. My friends, So grateful you joined me this time. So for this time and until next time, this is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired.